this is the best time to take a nice little nap, but I'm going to keep, again, try to keep you awake. Uh, the title of the talk is an interesting one, The UX Designer as a Private Detective. I'm just going to try to use a case study to show how things you know, kind of get murky when you're trying to solve uh, a problem with multiple stakeholders involved. So there's, there's, this is like a story. So the prelogue is I was working with Barilla, which is one of the world's biggest pasta and Italian food maker in the world. And you know, I was about to finish my thesis with them. And then suddenly my manager comes and he says, like, uh, Apur, I don't think you can put any of this, what you've worked in the last six months, in your thesis. And you know, at that point of time, I was like, OK, so w what do I really do? Uh, and then they said, OK, I'll talk to the Politecnico. And then I said, put the big boys to talk, Politecnico, Whirlpool, uh, Barilla, they all hashed it out. And then they said, OK, you don't have to write a thesis. And I was like, all good for me. I mean, like, there's a 30,000 mandatory thesis, and I'll be the first person to pass out without writing one. And I was all, all smiles with that. Um, so then I turned my attention to another side project that I've done, you know, apart from the main thing that was going on. I was working on another project, which was uh, Benessere Movimento, which in Italian basically means uh, move, uh, health on the go. So this is part one. In that project, what they were thinking that they were actually doing. So as I said, Benessere Movimento, it was a tie-up between a hospital just on the outskirts of Milan, Ospedale San Raffaele, and uh, Barilla, and European Union's health division. and they were trying to create a vending machine that was purely touch screen. You couldn't see anything but the touch screen. And you order on that. It's a nice 20, you know, 23, 24 inch diagonal touch screen. And they worked really hard off it, on it. Uh, the main problem that they were trying to solve was you know, when, when you're in Milan or any European city, in the mornings, most of the people skip breakfast. They just pick up an apple. And on the way, they'll have a coffee and the bar. And then if they're hungry again, they'll buy something from the vending machine. And most of the time, what's happening over there is the vending machine only stocked one chocolates, you know, soda, and barely anything which you can call healthy by a long shot. So this is what they built. I mean, they, they pretty much nailed the visual aspect of it. I mean, these, these, this is the coffee machine. These two are the food vending machines. And each of these machines actually cost 10,000 euros. They put a lot of money in it. There's a lot of research done, and both the Parties decide, okay, these are goals that we have to do, and we'll have to execute it in the next seven to eight months as a pilot program. But then when I came to the company, they were like, this is not working at all. I mean, daily sales were less than 20 pieces each. Monthly sales were less than 150 euros. And this was a complete bust. They had spent over 50,000 euros over it, and nothing was happening. People just were not buying. And so, since they saw me doing some service design, they come, OK, Apur, can you help in this? We are kind of stuck in this. Otherwise, you have to close it down in the next month. I said, OK. So I went there, and then I just, I just observed. You know, like I went there. I stood outside the vending machine, like you know, nothing to do, and just people coming around. They're walking in this high footprint area. It's right. You go out of the hospital. It's a metro. It's right in between these two things. So over 5,000 people cross it every day. And so that's, this is the first step I did. On, on, uh, I shadowed. So there's this really cool book I read, the Manual of Direction. I'm going to use quotes from there and try to put design parallels on it. So the expert detective's pursuit will go unnoticed, not because he's unremarkable, but rather like the suspect shadow, he's meant to be there. So uh, most of the people, when they think user research, they try to go, you know, OK, we have to do a lot of planning. We'll have to recruit people. We'll have to do this and that. But actually, the smallest thing, just going to your point of views and just observing people can give you a lot of ideas. How they're behaving with the non-human entities, how they're behaving with the human entities, what's really happening, are they angry, are they chill out, what, what's happening? This, that, even that can give you a lot of information. But you know, user research, traditionally in all in companies, I mean, it's virtually non, not there. It's just not there. I've tried many companies, and the only thing they do for user research Oh, I'll create a Google form, and I'll ask everyone, what do you want? That's it. That's, that's user research. So this is what I had. So I, I was standing there two hours with some breaks, 
and a total of 44 people walked into that space that I'd shown. And it, it used to go like this. So this is the space. Oh, it's very nice. Uh, what is going on? <laughs> that, that's the point. If I talk to them, did they answer anything over here? No, I don't know. Uh, is it, what is it? That's, that's the thing that will happen. So in Italian, they'll say, so They're like, what the fuck did these people actually do here? What is going on? Like, they cannot understand what's going on. So 12 people actually tried and went, oh, it's a touch screen. Tut, tut, tut. I don't know what is this. And two people actually had the money in their hands. They wanted to put it in the machine and get food, but they could not complete the transaction. And then after trying five or six times, they're like, fuck that. Off I go. So, so then the next step on evidence. So uh, you've done a little research. What, what he says on evidence is objects have memory too. The doorknob remembers who opened it last. The telephone who answered it. The gun remembers when it was last fired and by whom. And it is for the detective to learn the language of these things so that he can hear them when they try to say something. So when, when you're trying to do a little bit of work on anything at all, you must try to understand what medium you're working with. If it's web, if it's anything at all, you at least should know what is going on. When you click a button, what happens? What is the things that are coming in, what's coming out? What sort of feedback should we give? So understanding the medium is sort of important, if not tantamount. So this was my, you know, what I went back to Burrell and say, OK, uh, there's seriously some problems in there. There were 44 people. None of them could do anything. We need to change stuff. Uh, so this is the screen. The, this is the, imagine this is just slightly smaller. So this big, that screens. And everything is selectable. Everything is interactable. Imagine the number of orange, uh, sorry, purple boxes that you see. Almost all of them are interactable. And people do not know what can I click on or what can I touch. Plus, the mental model for vending machine in, uh, in particular is when you can see the food, you put in the number of the exact food you want, and then you pay the money. So here, they changed a lot of things. There was too much text on it. People didn't know what to do over Two, the location. So this is, as I said, between a hospital's basement and the metro. When you enter for exit from the hospital, you see this and this. And when you come, you're coming from the outside to the hospital, you see this and this. So this is just some uh, semblance of a poster that they have. And they could not find what is going on over there. What is there something uh, that needs my interest? Third thing, even the most illiterate guy who's selling vada pao on the street knows I have to say I am selling vada pao, otherwise nobody is going to come to me. So they had made this elaborate ruse to sell healthy food, but not even a single place in this entire place said that you can actually buy food in this area. And people were not in the you know, frame of mind to come and read all this text and try to understand what the hell is going on here. I mean, Dominic said last week, the hospitals are places where you either go when you are dying or someone you know is dying. There are lots of things that are going ahead, and nobody's going to open Zomato or Yelp and, what can I eat here? So you know, I looked at all this thing, and I'm like, I'm not going to work. And so I, Barilla was happy. Oh, you can change things? Please do. So this is point three. So you have something which is dead in water. You know, you know it's not going to work. In your full rain, go save the damsel in distress, you know, the knight in shining armor. And this is what you have in front of you. It's a corpse. So many cases begin this with one. This can be disconcerting. But at least you know where you stand. Worse is the corpse that appears pathway into your investigation and complicates everything. Best to proceed, therefore, with the vigilance of one who assumes that a corpse is likely around the next corner. That way, it's less likely to be your own. So something similar to this. I mean, I, I knew that there's a problem. But that, could, that would not be the end of it. I mean, I was, this was too simple to be you know, an open and shut case. So I went to you know, both the parties and said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'm there. I'll solve your problem. And do, no need to worry. And I'll do this on my own time, blah, blah, blah. So I'm with some more. If I solve problems, I'll, I'll do everything. And then I went up, making everything, uh, sleepless nights, three, four weeks. Then I had to communicate with the people who actually make the things. And then I got this. So this is the old design. This is the new design. I took whatever inputs I could took from the people inside. I did a lot of 
you know, low fidelity prototyping and show to people inside Barilla, to people in bars who I never knew and could hardly talk Italian at all. Uh, and then made something which everybody liked. So I showed it to Barilla, they said, this really looks good. We'll go and talk to the hospital and, you know, get things done. The other thing that we changed apart from the interface was the communication around the place. Uh, so earlier, whatever communication was there about how to eat healthy and what happens when you eat healthy, and really TLDR, I don't care. Uh, so what we did was make the communication really simple. So why una posa de benessere is do you want a healthy snack? Straightforward communication. Uh, again, volia de una posa, do you want a break? And directional uh, posters, okay, this is where you go to get stuff. And most people that I showed to thought that, okay, there is some logic in this and this might work. What do you think would be the reaction of the hospital? Who was the second stakeholder? Any guesses? This. <laughs> so so we, we, we present and then they said, no, this is not going to work and we can't allow Barilla to do the branding and we can't change. Our goal is to educate people and people are not eating healthy, blah, 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 all sorts of things. And Barilla wanted to introduce new things. I mean, one of the things that we don't, I miss in India is they had a small chocolate cake, which it's like a chocolate cake. It's 80 calories. They make it by steaming. And they wanted to introduce it in here. And hospital says, we can't allow cakes to be sold in a healthy store. So the, the concept of what is healthy was so you know, rudimentary and so set in stone that you, they, they can't imagine. The case, most of the times what happens is you're out of the house, you have five euros in your pocket, and you're hungry. So instead of buying a chocolate and a can of Coke, if you can buy something which is way more healthier, that is a win situation. But the hospitals know. We just cannot allow, there's a European Union this, and European Union that, and we just, and then they came back to Milan and told me, okay, Apur, whatever you did, it's like down the drain. And this was me. <laughs> And they're like, what? Like, this, is, this is so, what, what? And then on suspects. So they will present themselves to you first as victims, as aliens, uh, so allies, as eyewitnesses. Nothing should be more suspicious than someone who is trying to help you. You know, only if somebody is acting completely insane that he's really affected by something that's happened. So people who come ahead and say, you know, you, know, you can't really believe what people say. You only can believe what they do. So the people will come and ask me, how do you save your files? Oh, I go to save, and I go to this, and I go, I go to my folder, and I have the project name. And what they do is they save the file on desktop. So the other thing, on Nemesis. So normally, what do you want to do is very ideological. You know, I want to solve the world's problem. But really, when you have someone who is doing the exactly opposite, and you come to know, OK, this is not what I'm trying to do. And this is what I can really do, and this is how we need to proceed. So nemesis usually is one of the best things. Black hat people are necessary for UX design, otherwise your product sucks. Because until you've seen a true blue black hat person, you cannot weed out every possible kink in your armor. So part two, what they really were doing. And on surveillance is rather, you know, for UX designers, you always have to keep your eyes open. Nobody told me that I'll be working on a vending machine anytime soon. So, but you keep your eyes open. You see how people, uh, you know, work with vending machines. How they go there. How do they behave when they're trying to select the food item among it? And what happens when it eats up your money or the food gets stuck somewhere? What do they do? So these things you continuously have to. You know, keep absorbing inside yourself and then remembering how human beings behave around these things. And it's all about the users. So surveillance, always keep your eyes open. You, can, you might be thinking, oh, I'm not going to make a spoon, but why not? Maybe tomorrow you'll have a fingerprint thing to be done, and you never know. This is what was happening there. So Barilla and Ospedale were two enti main entities, and they were working completely against each other, but they never knew it. They both said, uh, my goal is to educate users. Barilla says, my goal is to test out my new line of healthy food products. And they both agreed. But then the way they want to do it was completely different. So you, you, never, uh, you never talk about these things that I don't want your branding to be there. You know, if you have a client, and if you have a client, uh, you cannot say that, I don't want to see your face till the project ends, OK? Just give me the project, go away, come back when the thing is done. 
that's what's going in your head, but then you can't really say it to them. Uh, so they were fighting against each other, and the problem at hand was one of the world's oldest problems. You know, should I go for a jog or should I shut down and watch that, you know, house episode that's on Star World now? So apple versus donut was the main problem. How do you select the right thing? And what Barilla was trying to do was just earn money. They didn't really care. They just, the only thing they cared is, okay, we'll sell this and see which one is selling more because all the products in the vending machine were pilot products. So there were fruit juices and everything which Barilla didn't go you know, all over Europe by then, but they were only test, being tested in that vending machine. So they wanted to validate which ones will sell, which ones won't, and then since only 20 things are being sold, they don't really getting, they're not really getting that feedback. And the hospital says, I don't care about Barilla. I just want this, the money to make this vending machine so that it looks cool in a hospital and you know, we educate everyone about heart disease. But no, I mean, both at the same time, if you do not take the right approach, it's never gonna happen. So I knew this is the problem, you know? So what he says about infiltration is the hideout, the safe house, the base of operations. You know, it's, you can always assume that the enemy has this, but whatever, uh, you know, even if you, if you know that there is one, I mean, what do you do about it? So I knew what is the problem. Barilla is fighting against this guy and they don't want to agree. Uh, what do I do about it? And I'm just an innovation management intern in a multi-million dollar company. Nobody listens to me, actually. So, you know, what they should be doing right now? I mean, I, in my head, the answer was clear. The answer was this. You know? <laughs> but uh, that wouldn't have a lot of traction. So listen to the user. I mean, the kind of research that they had done before was, I mean, I, I don't know how did they agree to it. There were questions like, and the first question in this survey, how much did you like the machine? Like, they don't even ask whether you liked it or no. Like, how much did you like between one to five? Was it good or it was like amazing? I mean, purely leading question to improve their, you know, NPSC set, whatever scores they want to do. Um, so what did I do about it? I mean, I was in a place where I didn't, wasn't involved in the project and uh, nothing was happening. So I went and talked to the head of innovation department again, and he said, like, okay, we need to get something done. And uh, so although the project hospital had very strong backing, you know, they had European unions, health department talking to Barilla and all that thing, and they were really powerful people, but I had the backing of something even more powerful than the European Union, and that's the Euros themselves. You know, Barilla said, okay, if you're not gonna do this our way, it's the highway to no money. You know, we are, we are pulling the funds, you can continue with the product, we don't want Barilla to be associated anymore because there's no value in it for us. So, then we gradually implemented the changes I've done, the new interface, the communication changes, etc., etc. and this was the result after about 10 months. I mean, I couldn't see to the end of this project, I had to come back to India, uh, but this was the uh, results that they sent me later. The time taken for the purchase had dropped by 2.4, times. So from 45 seconds to complete a purchase, it went down to 19%. The conversion level was twice, and the monthly revenue went up four times. Even then, it was a big fail for the thing, because most of the people already had seen that machine and were disillusioned about, this is not going to help me. So because the user research was not initially done correctly, the project was a big failure, 100,000 euros put into it over the 10 months and nothing came out of it. What can we learn here? I mean, this is probably something that I'll be repeating for, you know, and number of, everyone must have said this. So the role of the UX designer, uh, when you see on, on, on services like this, where you're not really directly dealing with interfaces, is, or anything in general, if you're a UX designer, your main role is not making the, you know, solution. Your decision is to identify the right problem to solve within that context of the project, and then guide the people who can actually build it, and you know, make these experience for the people. I mean, the detectives themselves never go and arrest the people. I mean, it's not in their power. So, let's say we, it's not in our power to make the perfect software machine or whatever experience, but rather tell the people who have this know-how on what problem to solve for the people so that it's most value. You know? Who remembers this guy? It used to be, he, he used to be in every 
street or you know every market of India doing his work in a corner with a bulb hanging over it. He is the guy who repaired watches. So this was a guy who you know is, is he's like a really important person. So UX designers right now are starting to get this importance. You know, you are the people who can make my software awesome. You know, uh, but then he was replaced by another guy. So till it comes, you can have a guess. Who replaced the watch repairers? Mobile repairs. Mobile repairs. So, so the problem they are solving is in a unique zone, right? I can't repair my mobile. You know, I don't. I can't go to the Samsung's factory if it's out of warranty. Uh, they are too busy, kind of thing. So there's this person sitting there who can do it for me. So UX designers are something like that in the organization right now. I mean, this guy knows what makes my software good and what makes my software bad. The product managers, though, are in print, like on in some gray area, do the same thing. What makes my product awesome? But then UX designers are actually the people who can get the thing shipped out. Is working. The next slide, obviously, is the person who's uh, repairing mobile phones. Uh, but then the final slide comes to, again, the role of the UX designer is never going to go obsolete as long as the world needs problem solvers. So our goal should be you know, not to go to that medium and then become so uh, in love with that medium that I'm, I, I start designing only for that. UX designers should be at a place where they have a bird's eye view of what exact problem to be solved. If we can't tell that to the people who are solving the problem, then we might as well join them and you know start doing the dirty work and getting our hands dirty in making stuff. So if you call yourself a UX designer slash service designer, whatever, your aim should be to identify problems. And there will be changes always. So this is what we're doing today. Tomorrow there are wearables. The, the you know decade after that might be augmented organisms after that it might be you know ice age which has usability issues and then there'll be time machines you know that time stamp that you take for granted for every interaction it does not hold true anymore <laughs> so this interaction happened yesterday does not make sense anymore how do you change the entire paradigm so the identifying the problems of what you're trying to solve who are you trying to solve is basically what we're supposed to do that's it i think Questions? Time? No?